Okay, I am super pumped about this video. So pumped that I felt like I needed to stand up for this one. I am so excited that I may or may not feel compelled to do a jazz kick every now and then. Sun and mood reads. Today I am sharing with you three new favorites that I discovered last month in September. Like I literally read them one after another, three in a row. Such a lucky run. And one of the books, I think it is safe to say that it is now top billing on my list. Number one read, definitely on par with my Jane Eyre. So it was a pretty exciting reading month to say the least. The three books were A Man Called Uva by Frederick Backman, The House in the Trulian Sea by TJ Klune, and The Wise Man's Fear, the second book in the King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. This and The Name of the Wind, so the King Killer Chronicles, top of my list now. Super excited to talk about them. Let's get to it. So the first book I'd like to talk about is A Man Called Uwe by Frederick Backman. It is a Swedish contemporary fiction uh, written, I think it was about eight years ago, translated into English, a really popular fiction. So I'm a bit late to the party. Reading this book has been a pretty long journey. I started reading this about eight months ago. So pre-COVID lockdown. And I'll explain why it's taken me so long to read this. But first, a bit of a summary. So this book is about a 60 year old man called Uva, who is introduced to us initially as the quintessential grumpy old man next door. I mean, we have all experienced this kind of person in one way or another, I think. Like literally, Uva is like the unanimated version of the old man in Up. There's a lot of similarities there. But as the story progresses, we look at his life as a child, a teenager, a young man, and then meeting the love of his life, his wife, Sonia. The onion that is Uva is peeled layer by layer, and you do begin to understand him and love him for the man he is. But it's not just about him, it's about the relationships he builds, much to his resistance, with his neighbours, and how that develops in an unexpected and life-affirming way. This story does tackle some pretty heartbreaking themes like grief, suicide, and the incredible loneliness and misunderstandings that the elderly go through in the later stages of their lives. Now this part of it is why I struggled to read this book in one go. I had to take some breaks. So I started reading this story in March, just before the COVID lockdowns. And you know, since then it's been eight months of being separated from my parents who are now seniors. And generally, as we know, this COVID crisis affects the elderly, not just physically in respect to the virus, but mentally and emotionally. The isolation that many of our grandparents, the elderly, uh, people who are in retirement villages, all the struggles that the community is going through. All these thoughts since March has been swimming around in my head. So I did need to take a bit of time to read this book because it was quite triggering. But having said that, the tone of the writing in this story is not confronting at all. It's exactly the opposite. And that is what's so brilliant about this book. Frederick Backman seamlessly explored these heavy themes with such quirk and charm and humor. Like I came out of this read with so many affirmations about life, about family and how this comes in many forms, the consolidation of love and connection that you can find this if you search for it. And even if you don't, it may come to you. And this actually leads me to a pretty far out affirmation that I had after reading this and just bear with me for a moment. But this story actually reaffirmed for me the existence of angels, fate, God's work, universe, karma, whatever you want to call it. This story reminded me that we may think one road or decision is what's best for us, but fate, angels, God, universe, etc. sometimes know what is best for us. So I absolutely loved, loved, loved this book. Okay, so now we move from life affirmations to love affirmations with The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klume. My goodness, what a joyous, wonderful ride this story was. It's a pretty new book released this year. I would say it's a contemporary soft fantasy fiction. At the beginning of the book, we are introduced to Linus Baker, who is a caseworker for the department in charge of magical youth. 
all in uppercase letters. He visits orphanages that house children with special magical ailments or abilities. So his job is to oversee these organizations and make sure that they're running properly and that the children are doing well enough. Linus is then assigned to a special case by extremely upper management in uppercase letters again. So you can already tell what kind of tone this story is. So much fun. This special case requires him to stay for a few weeks and observe a particular orphanage that houses only six children. And these six children have very, very unique special abilities. And this orphanage is run by a Mr. Panassus. Now, I won't go into too much detail of the profiles of these kids, but think like X-Men kids, but maybe a little bit more naive and endearing. I don't think this is going to be a spoiler because you are introduced to the kids very early on in the story. But I wanted to mention this particular kid because it really illustrates the humor of TJ Plume's writing. So one of the orphans is a six-year-old boy named Lucy, short for Lucifer, because it is claimed that he is the Antichrist. Oh my God, so many laugh out loud moments with this character. Like, could you imagine like this cute little six-year-old boy doing things that you would imagine a mini Antichrist would do? <laughs> anyway, as the story goes on, Linus's professional ice heart starts to melt as he gets to know the children and also Mr. Panassus. The relationships in this story just unfolds so beautifully. The setting, the world was just so charming and magical. For me, it was a little bit like the muggle world in Harry Potter. So you don't exactly know what era or period it might be, but it's familiar enough and contemporary enough that you can relate to it. There is this quaint magical charm to the world. But the story is definitely not all bubbles and fun and laughter. It does explore many important themes and draws parallel, I guess, to our current social cultural climate. It does explore prejudice, how a lack of knowledge or understanding of someone or a group of people does lead you to discriminate and treat people in a certain way, which is what happens to these kids and the community that have magical abilities. I really loved the exploration of what family love parental love and romantic love is. This exists in so many forms, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, culture, beliefs, race. And this was beautifully executed in the story. Every element that I wanted in a fun, joyous, heartfelt read was in this book. I think the best way that I can sum up this story, it's X-Men meets Harry Potter meets The Good Place, the TV series, because it has a similar kind of endearing humor and also uh, explores similar themes of morality, nature versus nurture, that kind of thing. And Parenthood, the film, not the TV series. So I hope that kind of gives you a vibe of what the book is like. It's so good. You need to read it. Please, please, please. All right, so now we have come to The Big Kahuna. This is the book, well, two books in the series that I can safely say that it is equal first now, The King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. First book being The Name of the Wind and the second book, The Wise Man's Fear, which is the book that I completed in September. Now, just before I get into my gushy review, I just wanted to not necessarily apologize ahead, but make you all aware of a couple of things. I am quite new to reading fantasy, so I only really started a few years ago and I began my King Killer journey early this year. Honest to God, I did not know anything about this book. All I knew was that it was a fantasy saga and that Lin-Manuel Miranda loved it and had film rights. That was good enough reason for me to give it a go. I know, I don't know how I missed hearing anything about this series, but upon finding out that there was a huge fan base, I then completely avoided any reviews, discussions, theories, anything to do with this series. I wanted to go in fresh-eyed, 
with absolutely no expectation and with no external influences. So there may be things that I am about to say that you have heard hundreds of times before, or there may be things that I say that is just so random and in your mind so contradictory that you're like, what is she talking about? So those things may happen, but keep in mind that I am like a toddler to this fantasy genre and to the King Killer Chronicles. And just like a toddler, I have much to learn. So I am open to discussion, open to learning, and even open to a little bit of condescension. That's fine with me. But I do also want to say, if you have had any experience in real life with toddlers, which I have as a mother, a teacher, and a librarian who does the story times for zero to six year olds, you will know that yes, toddlers have a lot to learn and we have a responsibility as adults to teach them things. But the brilliant thing about toddlers is that any experience they have is a first experience. They are fresh eyed. And so a lot of the things that we take for granted, they appreciate. So yeah, just keep that in mind. And now I'm done with the disclaimer. So let's get onto it. Okay, so just a quick background and summary to those out there who are not familiar with the series. So the story centers around a man called Quoth, who in the present day of the story is living as Cote, K-O-T-E, an innkeeper. Quoth decides to narrate his epic life story to a scribe. And that narrated story is the journey we readers go on in this book. There's a few little interludes here and there that takes us back to that present day of Quoth Coat the Innkeeper. But most of what we read is uh, basically him narrating his past. Does that make sense? Now, I would be here for a while if I went into details of all the events and adventures of Quoth. So just know that it is a majestic, sometimes unassuming and then suddenly unexpected saga of a fantasy story. The story is set in a world where the period is perhaps similar to the Middle Ages in England. Added onto what we are historically familiar with of that era, there is an existence and acknowledgement in varying degrees of magical systems, forces, parallel realities, etc. But this makes you think that the story is like really fantastical. It's actually not. These fantasy magical elements creep up on you and sometimes it exists so naturally and subtly you forget that what they are talking about or what's happening in the story is actually magic. For example, the people can attend a university called the Arcanum where they learn these magical practices. There are names for these magical practices like sympathy, sigildry, alchemy, and, uh, what was, and, oh, yeah, naming. And these magic systems are described so wonderfully. It's really intriguing and you really do learn it like it is an actual hard science. And this Arcanum University is where Quoth attends and spends a lot of the story in. The social political happenings at the Arcanum and things like Quoth's financial struggles to meet the uni fees. These are things that uni students experience nowadays. So what we are familiar with in our lives and what is magical and otherworldly in this story is so perfectly interwoven. But what I thought was going to be like a big boy's Hogwarts story. And it is a little bit like that for a while, to be honest. There are some parallels, but I was totally up for that. However, yeah, this story is so much more complex than that. In fact, I shouldn't have even mentioned Harry Potter. I don't know why I did that. It might give out the wrong impression, but too late. So throughout Quoth's journey, we are taken to many regions of this world and every land is just brilliantly depicted with such intricate details. But at the same time, I didn't find it too overwhelming for this fantasy novice. And also Rothfuss's portrayal of Quoth and all the other characters, major and minor, they were all so thoughtfully realized, really layered and quite vivid. Ah, this series. You know, the best way for me to describe what it was like reading these books, and bear with me again as I go a little bit arty farty, King Killer Chronicles is like a big mofo epic fantasy 13 act opera. That's what my King Killer reading experience was like. 
And this musical reference is well suited when describing King Killer Chronicles because Quoth is a gifted, very talented musician and comes from a line of traveling musicians and troubadours. Now, the music in the story is another element that I was just so surprised and blown away by. I have come from a professional musical background, so I am super critical when writers write about a character who is a musician or a singer. More often than not, I read their descriptions and to me it's obvious they are not a musician or they may be, they just haven't been able to transfer the experience into words. Patrick Rothfuss, um, I don't know if he is a musician or not. Like I said, I've avoided any backstories, backgrounds about the book or the author, but it really doesn't matter if he is or isn't. His descriptions of Quoth's experience when he plays his lute or sings, it's just so palpable and absolutely sublime. You can really hear the songs, like really, like I still hear them now. So this leads on to what I think is one of the main reasons why I love the King Killer Chronicles so much. It is Rothfuss's writing, his way of words. His writing is quite poetic and complex at times, but he writes in a way that the story is not lost. It's like he has like a paintbrush and he's like sweeping and creating this huge, beautiful masterpiece. But you see and are very aware of every stroke that he's making. But every now and then you kind of stand back and you just look at the masterpiece forming and you're just like, what? How does he do this? I just adore his writing. It tugs at your heart one minute. The next minute you are so shitty at Quoth's dicky decisions. The next minute you are laughing your ass off at some brilliant, funny, almost princess bride kind of moment. And then the next minute your mind is like completely completely blown away by some epic, fantastical event. I feel like Rothfuss just knows. I feel like Rothfuss and Quoth, they know exactly what they're doing. They are trying to charm the pants off you and it works. Like any other writer, I feel like it would come off as cocky, arrogant, a bit of a douchebag. But in this book, uh, it's just pure genius. So yes, I absolutely fell in love with the writing and because of that, I built this love and trust in the story and in Rothfuss's writing. So I guess I got to a point where even if there have been parts of the book that were maybe questionable, it was too late. The web was spun for me. Which leads me to talking a bit about the second book, The Wise Man's Fear. Though yes, I have avoided reviews, etc. I do kind of roughly know that there is a bit of mixed feelings about this second book. I think I maybe understand where that might be coming from. Like for example, a big portion of the book at the start is about the relationships, the comings and goings of Quoth's uni life, which I actually loved being immersed in. But it did go for a while to the point where yes, I was enjoying it and was along for the ride, but I did wonder is it going to move on? And I did consider for a moment maybe having a break from reading the book, but then the thought of just leaving Quoth, that was not a possibility. But as soon as I started thinking that, the story did move on, and boy did it move on. Oh my god. Seriously, the seven act opera that is The Wise Man's Fear just went from like quaint, classical, baroque to bloody epic Hans Zimmer shit to freaking trippy The Who's Tommy kind of opera. <laughs> and if you've read the second book, you know what I mean by that trippy opera bit. Trippy. Honestly, the story covers it all. All you can do and all I did was just surrender to the ride and I loved every freaking moment. So as you can see, I am in love. And like any person that's newly in love, I realize that this is the beginning of an amazing relationship. I am absolutely certain that I have missed so many things within the story, so many layers. I haven't even gone into like the folklore and the magic systems and, and you know, the driving force of Quoth. I didn't really want to do that because I felt like that was going to lead to spoilers. But I realize this is just the beginning and I'm telling you as soon as I press publish on this video, I am online, I am going to be looking at every review, every theory, <laughs> watching booktubers about the King Killer Chronicles. I will be lapping it all up.
And so yes, King Killer Chronicles is up there now. It may, may, may surpass Jane Eyre, depending on the third book, if it ever comes out. But seriously, I just feel like I am blinded by love. I am far too gone. Even if the third book is literally Rothfuss writing, Quoth has turned into a potato, the end. I'm still going to be like, genius, genius. Yeah, I am too far gone. <laughs> Okay, so they were my favorite reads. A Man Called Eva by Frederick Backman, The House in the Trillian Sea by TJ Clune, and The King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. Seriously, people, let me know what you think of my new favorites. Let me know what you think of King Killer Chronicles. I am like a sponge. Please feed me. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Sun. This is Sun and Mood Reads. Please subscribe if you feel compelled to do so. And yeah, I will see you next time. Bye. Sun and Mood Reads.